Attention pilots for Uncle Ned's squadron. There's an exciting story today. Twelve model planes will be given away, two cadets will get phone calls, and some lucky cadet pilot will win a never-to-be-forgotten sightseeing plane ride over the city of Chicago. And here he is, the man to get the meeting underway, your commanding officer, Uncle Ned. Hi, pilot! <laughs> Welcome to another squadron meeting. I'm glad to see you, and I'm glad to know that you're listening at home. Let's start out the right way by yelling out our official slogan. And you cadets at home, try to yell louder than the cadets here in the ready room. All set? Let's go all together now. Look! I don't know who yelled the loudest, the cadets at home or those in the ready room, but you all did a good job. Well, let's have our executive officer come up here, and Flight Commander Downs, will you introduce him? I sure will, Uncle Ned. His name is Ronald Gulotta, and he lives at 37, or rather 67, 35 South Colmar here in Chicago. He's a sharp-looking boy, and I know he'll do a good job for you. And now, Executive Officer Ronald Gulotta, will you read the orders of the day for Uncle Ned's squadron? I am going to give away at least 12 model planes today, so pay attention to everything and try to win one. If you haven't joined the squadron yet, you're missing a lot of fun. We want you in the o official family, so join today. Flight Commander Down will tell you how. That is all. Well, Executive Officer Ronald Holada, you did a swell job, and you earned your plane. Before you take it, though, tell me how many cadets in the ready room have had rides in a real plane. Nine cadets have... Here, rise, Uncle Ned. Nine, that's fine. I wish I could talk to all of them, but I'll have to settle for one. Flight Commander Downs, who will it be? Well, Uncle Ned, it's going to be a young chap named Tim Hedlund, who is right here, ready to tell you about his plane ride. Well, good. Tim, tell me about your ride. Where did you go? When did you take your ride, and did you like it? Well, um, the pilot landed um, on Thunder Lake. And um, he stopped there to eat at the lodge. Oh, it was in a seaplane. Mm-hmm. Well, fine. How long ago was this? Oh, um, I think it was last year. Good. Now tell me more about it. Well, when um, after he was done eating, he took us out for a sight, uh, see. sightseeing ride. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And um, then we were. Um, he had to give the motor lots of power to get, take her off. You get it off of that water. Yeah, it takes a little more time to get it off the water than it does off the land. Mm-hmm. You remember what kind of an airplane it was? Um, that was uh, um. Stinson, maybe? I think it was a Stinson. A Stinson on floats. Mm -hmm. Well, swell. Have you ever had a ride in a land plane? No. Well, you, you'll have something to look forward to, and then you can compare the two of them, mm -hmm. can't you? Well, I, I hope you have a lot more real good rides. Thank you for telling me about it, and Executive Officer Ronnie has a model airplane for you. Boys and girls, the time you spend now finding out about planes will help you later on. Later on, you won't have to spend the time learning. You can spend your time doing. This is F-74 to UNS Control Tower. F-74 to UNS Control Tower, over. This is Uncle Ned in UNS Control Tower. Go ahead, F-74. F-74 to Uncle Ned. F-74 to Uncle Ned. What's the mission for the week? What's the mission for the week? All pilots, stand by. <laughs> The mission for the week is be ambitious. Have a goal in life. Tell yourself what you want to do, what you want to become, what you want to have, and then work hard to reach that goal. It'll take ambition. It'll take a lot of it. But it's all right because you have a lot of ambition. You have to use it, though. You have to keep it fired up. The dictionary says that the word ambition means the eager desire for success. Have an eager desire. Want to attain your goal. Fight for it and you'll be accomplishing this mission. You'll be ambitious. Remember the mission, pilots. It's be ambitious. Pilots, what's the mission for the week? Be ambitious! Be sure to remember the mission for the week, pilots, and here's why you should. In addition to the two phone calls I make each week during our meetings... 
Two more phone calls will be made during the week by Chief Navigator John Cowan. If the pilots call during the week and remember the mission, they will receive model planes just like those we give away in the ready room. This past week, Chief Navigator Cowan called Lester Darling of 7044 North Greenview here in Chicago. Les remembered last week's mission, be considerate, and won a plane. We made another call, but the member didn't remember last week's mission. So remember the mission, because if you're called during the week, you can win a fine model plane, too. Flight Commander Downs, invite everybody to the ready room, will you? It's a pleasure, Uncle Ned. You bet you're invited to the ready room, friends. Come down any and every Saturday morning. You'll find the ready room on the 19th floor of the Merchandise Mart. That's in the NBC studios here in Chicago. Now, we'd like to have you here and in your seats by 9.30 because we have a lot of work to do before the meeting gets underway. Now, for instance, we have to draw numbers to see who's going to answer Uncle Ned's questions. And we have to find out who answered our blackboard question correctly. That's the question that everybody gets to try to answer, and the cadet who does the job gets to repeat the qualifications at the end of the meeting, and you know what he gets. He gets a swell plane ride over the city. Now, you can come to the meetings in a group, if you wish, or you can come alone. We're glad to have you here either way. Try to make it next Saturday, won't you? We'll all be looking for you. Uncle Ned, they're all invited now, and are we going to do some hangar flying at this time? Yes, according to the schedule, we're going to do some hangar flying right now. We're going to have a review We'll brush up on what we've talked about for the past three weeks. Four weeks ago, we started talking about helicopters, and we found that Leonardo da Vinci, the great Italian artist and poet, was the first man to make a good model helicopter. So he's known as the father of the helicopter. We found, too, that a helicopter can fly in five directions. It's the only thing that can do that. Lots of cadets wanted to know what the blades on top of a helicopter were called, so we told them. They're called rotor blades. And we said that they acted like a wing on a plane, that they create lift, just like a wing does. The following week, we discussed some of the things helicopters do, such as carrying mail, helping forest rangers spot forest fires, and the police in large towns use them for rescue work, too. We learned that at the present time, helicopters are expensive. The average small helicopter costs about $25,000. They burn about 12 gallons of gas an hour, and the rotor blades on top turn around about 300 times a minute. You have to have special training to fly a helicopter. Your regular pilot's license isn't enough. Well, the next week we talked about a fine aeroplane, the packet. And the packet is the plane that drops paratroopers and food and medical supplies and even heavy pieces of machinery and cannons. The packet has two engines. They're big ones, 3,500 horsepower each. It takes a crew of five to operate the packet. It can fly along at 250 miles an hour, loaded with over 30,000 pounds of supplies or cargo. It's a big plane, 110 feet from wingtip to wingtip, and it's 86 feet long. Now pay attention, because you'll find the answers to the questions I'm going to ask in what I'm going to say right now. Remember these things. Leonardo da Vinci is known as the father of the helicopter. A helicopter can fly in five directions. The small ones cost about $25,000. They burn about 12 gallons of gas an hour. The rotor blades turn around about 300 times a minute, and they act just like a wing on a plane does. They create lift. The packet has two engines. It can carry over 30,000 pounds of cargo. It's 110 feet from wingtip to wingtip, and it takes a crew of five to operate the packet. Flight Commander Downs, it's solo time. And here's the first cadet on the line, Uncle Ned. He's warmed up and ready to go. And here's the first question, and there's a model plane waiting for you if you answer it. Who is the father of the helicopter? Oh, no. Leonardo da Vinci. Well, that's close (laughs) enough. Yes, sir. Leonardo da Vinci. You did a good job. And one real little cadet did a good job, too. What's your name? Kenny Salada. Kenny, where do you live? 6735 South Coma. Are you our executive officer's brother? Yes. Well, oh, wonderful. Oh, so you go over to your brother. Does he give you things very often? Most brothers don't, no. you know. He doesn't. Well, he's going to give you a model airplane right now. You are a good cadet. <laughs> and here's question number two. About how much does a small helicopter cost? About... $28,000. I, I beg your pardon. Don't tell me that one. About how much does a small helicopter cost? 
$25,000. You're right. You have it. Yes, sir. About $25,000. What's your name? Alfonso Lapalooza. How old are you? Twelve. Where do you live? 613 West Oak Street. Have you ever built a model airplane? Yes. What kind did you build? Do you remember the name of it? Okay. How long ago was it? About a month ago. A month? You haven't built one this month, then. Well, you're going to have an opportunity right now because our executive officer has a good one for you. You go over and get it. Thank you for being alert. Here's question number three. How much gas does a small helicopter burn in an hour? Now, that's a tough question for a small pilot. About how much gas does a small helicopter burn in an hour? Eight. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give you an F-74. I'm giving you an F-74 that you'll have a lot of fun with. And here's a good-looking pilot with a, an airplane on the back of his jacket. How much gas does a small helicopter burn in an hour? Twelve gallons. You're right, about twelve gallons of gas an hour. What's your name? Johnny Miller. Johnny, how old are you? Ten. Where do you live? 3757 North Kenmore. What are you here in Chicago? Yes. You must like airplanes because you've got them on your jacket, do you? Yeah. Well, that's fine. Our executive officer has one for you. You go over and get it while I answer this phone. Fine. Our NBC operator has a cadet on the line. Hello? Hello, this is Uncle Ned in the WMAQ ready room. Who do you have on the line for me? Jack Albert of Rock Falls. All right. Hello? Hello, Jack? Jack, this is Uncle Ned in the WMAQ ready room. How are you? Good. Do you live in, in Rock Falls, Jack? You know, I fly over Rock Falls a lot. That's right near Sterling and, and a little west of Dixon, isn't it? And the Rock River runs by there, doesn't it? Sure, I've used that Rock River as a landmark a lot of times. Real good to talk to you, and here's a question for you that I hope you can answer. And if you do answer it, you're going to get two model airplanes, because last week the question was missed. You all set? How old are you? You're 11 years old. All right, here we go, Jack. The rotor blades on top of a helicopter turn around about how many times a minute? Try hard. Oh, there are a lot of hands in the ready room that are ready to answer this question. I beg... Uh, Jack, maybe you didn't understand it. The rotor blades on top of a helicopter turn around about how many times a minute? Oh... Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I'm sorry. The answer is 300 times a minute. But next week, somebody is going to win three aeroplanes if they answer the question in this category. Thanks, Jack, and I'm going to dip my wings the next time I go over Rock Falls. Bye. Say, he sure tried anyway. And here's question number five. How many people does it take to operate the packet? Five. Five, you're five. right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. E. Tell me what your name is. How old are you, Kenny? Eleven. Where do you live? 1060 North Francisco. Here in Chicago? Yeah. Good. Have you ever won a model plane down here before? Uh-uh. You haven't? Well, you just did. And go over to our executive officer and get it and have a lot of fun with it. Question number six. How far is it from wingtip to wingtip on the packet? That's a tough question. How far is it from wingtip to wingtip on the packet? Twenty-four feet. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's 86 feet long, and it's so far from wingtip to wingtip. I'm sorry. You take that F-74, and we have one fella right here, this little fella in the second row, come up real quickly and tell me how far it is from wingtip to wingtip on the packet. An Oh, I'm sorry. You have an F-74. You get an F-74. You tell me how far it is from wingtip to wingtip on the packet. 86 feet. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you the answer. It's 86 feet long. It's 110 feet from wingtip to wingtip. Now, Flight Commander Downs, I think we've got some boys and girls listening today for the first time. Will you tell them how they can join the squadron? Yes, sir, Uncle Ned. I sure will, because we want them to join right away. Now, here's how you join, boys and girls. Get a penny postcard and put your name, age, address, and phone number on it. Send the card to Uncle Ned, WMAQ, Chicago, 54, Illinois. That's all there is to it. When we hear from you, we'll send you the official membership card, and we'll put your name on our phone list, the list that we use to make the two phone calls every week. Remember now how you do it. Get a penny postcard, put your name, age, address, and phone number on it, and send it to Uncle Ned, WMAQ, Chicago, 54, Illinois. 
And when you do that, you'll be an official member of the squadron, and you'll have a membership card to prove it. Join today and become an official cadet pilot. Now, Uncle Ned, back to you. Thank you, Flight Commander Downs. Pilots, here's something for you if your birthday is today. From all of us to all of you, whoever you are and wherever you are, If you were born today, August the 18th, you were born in the day that the first English child was born in America. Yes, on August the 18th, 1587, Virginia Dare was born on Roanoke Island. Roanoke Island later became North Carolina, and there on August the 18th, 1587, Virginia Dare was baptized. You were born in the day the first English child was born in America. Now, Uncle Ed, it's story time. This is a story of test pilot Johnny Jones. Johnny Jones was born on a farm in Nebraska. He went to a small country school, and later when his family moved to town, Johnny Jones stayed on the farm. He liked it there, and despite his dad's urging to come live with the rest of the family, Johnny Jones stayed on the farm. After school, he'd do the chores and then head for the fireplace to read. Johnny Jones wanted to be a doctor when he grew up. His uncle was a doctor, and Johnny thought that the best way life he could lead would be a life of saving lives. Johnny was in his last year of school. Next year, he'd go to the university, and after years of hard study, he'd be Dr. Johnny Jones. He was lying on the floor in front of the fireplace one night when he heard a sound so loud it rattled the windows in the house. Johnny jumped up and made a beeline for the door. It was a plane, a plane that must be in trouble. Once more, the plane dove in the house. In the black night, Johnny could make out the face of a worried pilot as he shot past the door where Johnny was standing. He needed help, and he must need it bad. Johnny ran into the house and grabbed up a lantern. He tore through the barnyard, jumped a fence, and headed for the pasture. Johnny ran to the far end of the field and motioned with the lantern for the circling pilot to land over him. The pilot knew what he meant. Johnny crouched on the ground, holding the lantern high, hoping he was doing the right thing. The plane made a sweeping circle and came straight towards the shaking lantern. Johnny couldn't see the plane, but he knew it was close. The engine was getting louder. Then it was silent. And the next thing Johnny heard was a shrill whistle as the plane glided right over his head. It bumped to a landing, and Johnny raced to the pilot. The plane was out of gas. The pilot knew he couldn't reach his destination, so he decided to make a forced landing while he still had power. His last drop of gas was used just as he went over Johnny's head. They tied the plane down in the pasture, and Johnny led the tired pilot to the house. He'd spend the night there, and the next morning, they'd get gas. They stayed up almost all night talking about airplanes, and in the morning, when the plane was refueled, the pilot offered to take Johnny for a ride. Johnny climbed in the plane. The pilot started the engine, and after a bumpy takeoff, Johnny was looking down on the farm. This was a new thrill. This was better than anything Johnny had ever done. About ten minutes later, the pilot yelled at Johnny to put his hand on the stick and his feet on the rudders. Go ahead, fly it, Johnny. Johnny Jones had the time of his life. The pilot would tell him what to do, and Johnny would do it. He had perfect coordination. He was at home in the air. They landed, and Johnny's mind was made up. He'd have to wait to be a doctor. He had to be a pilot first. The pilot took off, and that same afternoon, Johnny went to town to talk to his dad. He told him about the plane and told him that he wanted to be a pilot. He'd be a doctor later. Johnny's dad didn't object, so Johnny loaded himself with more books, this time books about planes. When school was out, Johnny left the farm and went to an airplane factory where he got a job helping build planes. After work, he'd go to the field where the company test pilots would teach him to fly. Johnny learned fast, and in one year, he was hired as a test pilot. This 19-year-old scientist, Johnny Jones, was the best test pilot of the lot. Johnny had the hard jobs to do, and he did them well. Every time a new plane was built, Johnny took it on its first flight. He had lots of close calls, and in one year, he had to make five parachute jumps. The factory was working on a new speed plane. It would be the fastest thing in the air. Johnny was anxious to fly it. It was a wicked-looking plane, fast and powerful, and the mechanic said the plane was a jinx. It was a killer. Johnny studied it carefully, and the more he studied it, the more cautious he became. He began to think that it was a killer. It wasn't tough enough for all the speed it had. It wouldn't hold together. Finally, the plane was done. It was rolled out of the hangar where it stood waiting for test pilot Johnny Jones. Johnny had been doing some serious thinking about being a doctor. He'd saved his money. If he quit now, he could go to college and in a few years be Dr. Johnny Jones. 
He walked into the president's office and told him that he'd fly the new plane. He'd test it the best he could. But then he was going to quit. The president didn't argue with him. Test pilots knew when they should quit. At six o'clock the next morning, Johnny walked to the killer plane. The mechanics were quiet. They didn't like the plane. They didn't want Johnny to fly it. He crawled in, gave the signal to start the engine. It caught at once. Johnny pulled his goggles down and taxied the killer plane to the end of the runway. For the first time, Johnny Jones was scared. One more flight and he was through. One more flight and he could start to become Dr. Johnny Jones. This was it. Get it over with. He pushed the throttle in and the plane jumped down the runway. It took to the air faster than anything Johnny had ever flown. And in no time, he was at 10,000 feet. He did all the maneuvers he was supposed to do. All except a power dive. He was saving that until last. He pulled the nose up and went to 15,000 feet. Johnny was scared. He cruised around for a little while. Then, with grim determination, he pushed the stick forward. The plane roared faster and faster it went. He was going over 200 miles an hour. The ground was coming up fast, but he had to hold the plane in the dive. Give her all she'd take. The plane started to shake. Johnny held tightly. It was vibrating badly. He couldn't stay in it if it kept up. Johnny glanced at the dials and saw that he was going over 300 miles an hour. A little more and then... A wing crack. Pieces of the right wing flew past Johnny. The plane whipped around in tight circles. He couldn't control it. Straight as an arrow, the plane was winding itself to the ground. Johnny had to get out. He tried to push up on the seat, but the force held him in. He'd have to jump away from the plane when he left or it would cut him. Johnny tried until he was dizzy. One more try. He pushed himself up and out, and he was free. He pulled the ripcord in his chute and watched the killer plane dive to the earth. After Johnny landed, he went back to the factory where he hung up his chute took his test information to the engineers, said goodbye to his friends and aviation. Johnny Jones was a brilliant boy. He made lots of friends. He did a lot of good. And when he died a few years ago, everyone sung the praises of Dr. Johnny Jones. Uncle Ed, some junior-sized test pilots want to test fly a question or two right now. Well, good. Let the first one take off on this question. What was Johnny Jones doing when he heard the plane the first time? Remember, he heard the plane fly over the house. What was he doing then? He was wondering. He was what? Wondering. Well, he wasn't wondering, no. He was, he was really doing something. Remember, he wanted to be a doctor and he was, he was, what was he doing? What was Johnny Jones doing that first time? Oh, I'm going to give you an F-74. Thank you for trying and remember. Remember, it isn't always the results that count, but it's how hard you try. All right, you tell me what Johnny Jones was doing when he heard the plane for the first time. He was reading his books. That's right. He was laying on the floor, lying on the floor, reading the books. You're right. What's your name? Alan Gold. Alan, how old are you? Nine. Nine years old. Good. You go over to our executive officer and get a fine Comet Struck Dual Speed model plane. Where did Johnny direct the pilot to land? Remember, where did he tell him to land? He directed him whereabouts. Oh, look at all the hands in the ready room. Whereabouts? In a field. In a field. Well, that's close enough. It was in a pasture, sure. Okay. You did a good job. Now, what's your name? Johnson. What is it? Louder. Johnson. Johnny, how old are you? Nine. You're nine years old. Have you ever won an airplane down here? No. You just did. Go over to our executive officer. Get it and have a lot of fun when you build it. Why did the pilot have to find a place to land? Because he was out of gas. You're right. He was out of gas. You betcha. In a loud voice, tell me what your name is. Richard Burdick. Dick, how old are you? I'm ten. I'm glad you won an airplane. Where do you live? 121 West Chestnut. Here in Chicago? Yes. Well, swell, I'm glad you won, and our executive officer has it, and our NBC operator, fine, has another pilot in the line. Hello? Hello, this is Uncle Ned in the ready room. Who do you have in the line for me? Barbara Kosmoski of Chicago. All right. Hello? 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 Hello. Well, well, let's see. I I think that Barbara must have hung up. I tell you what we'll do. We'll ask another question, and then we'll see if we can get that through. And here is a question for you, for our red-headed pilot. What caused the killer plane to crash? Uh, the right wing uh, came off. That's right. The wing broke in that real steep power dive. What's your name, redhead? David Harrell. What is it? David Harrell. Dave, how old are you? 
12. You're 12 years old. Where do you live? 166 West Chicago Avenue. Here in Chicago. That's swell. Our executive officer has a fine model airplane for you. And here is another question, and I sure hope that you can answer it. What did Johnny use to signal the pilot... When he flew over the farmhouse. A lantern. A what? A lantern. You're right. He used a lantern. You betcha. Boy, I'm glad you answered that. What's your name? Barry Hippert. What is it? Barry Hippert. Barry, how old are you? Ten. You're ten years old. Good. You have a model plane coming, and I have one more question if we have another Let's cadet. Let's take the cadet out of the audience, Uncle Ned, because we're unable to reestablish the phone call. All yeah. right, fine. Here now, he- here is the question that... that is usually used on the phone call. How long did Johnny work at the factory before he became a test pilot? One year. One That's year, right. you're right, you betcha. All right, what's your name? Bruce Clapper. Bruce, how old are you? Twelve. You're twelve years old. Where do you live? 3028 South Central Park. Here in Chicago. Chicago. And you have a, a pilot's hat on. I'm real glad that you answered that question. Go over to the executive officer and get a model plane for it. Well, that takes care of the solo test flying today, pilots. Have good test flights with the planes you won. Now it's time to repeat from memory the qualifications for membership in the squadron. Flight Commander Downs, introduce the boy who answered the blackboard question correctly and now gets a chance to win a swell plane ride over the city. His name is Bruce Allen, Uncle Ned. I bet he can do a good job and just as good a job on those qualifications as he did on our blackboard question. Well, we'll find out right now. Okay, Bruce Allen, remember... You're going to repeat the qualifications for memory, and if you do, if you do the job, you're going to get a swell plane ride over the city of Chicago for yourself, your brothers and sisters, or your folks. Okay, when I count three, go. One, two, three. One, obeys established authority. Two, observes the rules of health. Three, promotes safety in the air and on the ground. Four, keeps self clean and alert. Five, accomplishes every mission. Oh, you did a fine job, a real fine job. You take this ticket to Miss Joan Gard at Lakefront Airways at Meg's Field, and one of their real good pilots will crawl in a fine aeroplane with you and your folks, and you'll get the finest ride you've ever had, and you'll also get a year's subscription to Air Force, the official publication of the Air Force Association. Congratulations to you, Bruce. Have a lot of fun. Have you ever had a ride in an airplane? No. Good, good. I'm glad that you got your first ride this way. Uh, Who are you going to take with you? Um, I don't know. You're, you're going to kind of noise it around, are you? Yeah. He wants to go swell. Have a lot of fun. Pilots, remember to be ambitious. Remember to listen next Saturday at 10 and join the squadron now if you're not a member. Until we get together again next Saturday, this is Uncle Ned thanking you for all the nice letters. I'll write to you just as soon as I can. And saying for the entire crew in the ready room, so long, pilot. The ready room door is closed now until next Saturday. Cadets, be sure that you're either listening at home or are present when the doors open again next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock for another meeting. Now, let me tell you once more how to join the squadron so that by next week you can be an official member. Get a penny postcard and put your name, age, address, and telephone number on that card. And send it to Uncle Ned, WMAQ, Chicago 54, Illinois. That's all there is to it. We'll send you the official membership card, and we'll put your name on our phone list, too. Then you'll have a chance to get one of the two phone calls that Uncle Dad makes to members each week. Now, remember that you're welcome here in the ready room whenever you can come down. You'll find us on the 19th floor of the Merchandise Mart in the NBC studios in Chicago. And be sure your dial is set on the 670 spot next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock for another meeting of Uncle Ned's Squadron. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.